And then, um, and then in 1998, I decided to make my own comics. Um, so on the left, you see my one of my very first sketches I did of this character called El Muerto. That's from 1994, I think. Um, I, I was going to do a, a team of superheroes. So I had like five or six characters. But then the more I thought about it, I go, well, I don't want to do my first book with six characters because that's a lot of characters, right? And then there's going to be six good guys, six bad guys. And then each character is going to have their own supporting cast. Like that's too many characters for a first time guy to do a comic. Um, so the first comic I ever did, there's on the right. It was just a black and white photocopied, uh, really cheaply done uh, a book called El Muerto. It's about a young man. He's born on Day of the Dead. And on his 21st birthday, he gets killed in a car accident. And he ends up getting resurrected by the Aztec god of death. Because for my first comic, I knew I wanted to do something that I wanted to do, my own personal type of story. But I wanted to involve Mexican culture, Aztec mythology, they have the dead folklore, things that you didn't see in comics a lot, or even pop culture back in 1998. Mm -hmm. And that, that's some more of the uh, the early issues of El Muerto. Um, the, the, the page on the left, I know it looks very bloody, but yeah, that's where he gets his heart ripped out by the god of death that he sacrificed, basically. Which, you know, I tell parents, kids will read about that in their history, about the Aztec sacrifice and all that. Um, but it's a moody comic. It's supernatural elements, gothic elements, but also it's got humor in it. And believe it or not, it's, it's kind of like a telenovela. It's got a lot of romance and stuff like that when he's not involved in the supernatural stuff. Uh, just more images of the character, you know, the costume. I wanted to give him something very that, that would look very iconic, also very Mexican. So I figured a mariachi suit would be really simple for people to look at and identify. So with, with the mariachi suit and the, the skull face, right, which recalls uh, Day of the Dead, I thought the character would be like instantly recognizable to people without even reading the book. Like, okay, something about this character, he seems to come from Mexican folklore, Mexican background. Oh, and on um, 2007, they made a movie out of my character. So I published the first issue in 1998, and I did a few books, and then um, I got contacted by a film director, uh, Brian Cox. He had, he had heard an interview I did on um, NPR with El Muerto, so he got a hold of me, but he got a hold of some of my comics. I had a meeting with him. Uh, I got a lawyer. He got a producer. And then a few years later, 2007, we released this film, independent film uh, starring Wilmer Valderrama from that 70s show, playing El Muerto. And that's a picture of me at the Oxnard Film Festival. Um, I'm just giving her an autograph, no phone number, just one of the attendees at the show. <laughs> and I've done other comics besides El Muerto, uh, The Man Swamp, The Dinasario, The Coma, Le Voodoo Sants, it's a couple. Uh, who practice uh, uh, voodoo. Mm -hmm. So I want to show you my process here because people aren't sure sometimes how comics are made. Um, I don't write a script. What I do, I draw the entire story out on uh, what, copy paper, 8.5 by 11 copy paper. Uh, we used to call it Xerox paper, but... Um, or no, we used to call it mm -hmm. typing paper, but nobody mm -hmm. types anymore. So 8.5 eight and and by 11 white paper. I just draw the whole story out. That's why it's drawn very rough looking. Because at this stage, it's not important that it looks good. What's important for me is figuring out the pacing, each composition for each panel, what the character is doing in the panels, blah, blah, blah. So the second stage after this. So once I'm satisfied with the entire uh, manuscript, I'll make edits. Now I redraw it on large paper, kind of like what I have here really quick. This is an actual, this is the size I work at, 11 by 17. And uh, you can see that it's all hand drawn by ink and pen. And I still hand draw my stuff. I don't, I don't digitally draw. So this next phase is to draw the whole book. First with pencil and then with black ink. That's what that black is. So it stands out. And then the third stage in this particular book 
you'll notice I have a what they call gray tones, like his uh, the pant the like his pant leg and such, and the wall. So I have gray tones. Um, I do color books too, but not as many because they're more expensive. Um, so I add gray tones if necessary to the particular story. And then there's one more stage, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, the lettering stage, right? So that's where I do the writing. And I do that by computer. Um, because I, when I drew it out, I was already imagining what's going to be said, more or less. But at this stage is where I do the actual writing. I write it. I edit it. I refine it. Make sure you know the dialogue flows and all that. And um, that's the, those are the four basic steps to do my comics. And I think that's the end of the slide. So you can put me on full screen if you'd like. Oh, all right. Very good. Very interesting. I, yeah, I yeah, love thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And um, I also teach comics. I teach comic book workshops at schools. I work for like nonprofit organizations. And um, I've been doing that about 20 years. So I teach either like a one hour workshop, like a five week workshop. I've taught semester length for uh, grade school, middle school, high school students. Um, I've done some college lectures and such. Um, but the thing about comics, as far as teaching, we're all teachers here, you know, the way I approach it is it's just storytelling, right? Every kid, believe it or not, no matter how shy they are or how cool they are, too cool for school, they all want to tell their stories somehow. Some do it through um, sports, but most of them do it with some type of art. They want to dance. They want to play guitar. They want to write. They want to draw. Some of them want to combine the drawing and the writing with comics. That's what comics is, right? No matter what the subject matter is, whatever, it's um, it's just words and pictures, right? So this, e even the panels without dialogue, the student is reading what's going on. You know, um, the cars approaching the building and then they read some dialogue, da, da, da. So what I'm so grateful for as a comic fan and creator is... Like the, the movies are great. It's great that there's all these big giant movies and making billions of dollars and TV shows and all that. But the real victory for comics is this, that you educators are using comics as curriculum, as a bridge to literacy. And that's been going on for a very long time, but it's, it's never been more prevalent than now. I mean, just I'm speaking to you guys and Araceli designed this uh, meeting over comics. Um, comics are taught in universities. Uh, like I said, I've taught them in classes. So because people figured out that comics is a bridge to literacy, but it's also a form of expression. And some, and you know, I, I've taught classes where I'm always surprised what the kids are drawing. Little kids, not even anything profound, but just the fact that they have this idea for the story of these two strawberries, right, that become little characters and they go about some little episode. To me, that's that's still amazing to see a kid make a comic, you know, because that's a lot of work, drawing it and then writing and pulling it all together. So anytime that I'm able to, you know, facilitate a class where kids are uh, learning comics, I'm all for that, right? And I'm sure you guys as instructors are always looking for ways to get your students to engage and really to express themselves. Because again, ultimately, that's all comics is. It's the self-expression like any other art form. So um, most kids like to draw there is a certain age, like those of you who work with younger kids, grade school, like they all draw for the most part. And then at some point, I, I don't know what the exact age is, some of them start realizing, they th they tell themselves that, oh, I can't draw as good as her or, you know, I don't feel it's looking right. So they kind of get away from drawing because they don't want to expose themselves. Whereas the rest of us dorks, we don't know any better. So like we just keep drawing through middle school high school, college, and beyond, make a career out of it, maybe. So um, I think you'll find that, you know, if you come out with some type of program, like the zines you're going to be looking at, or mini comics, whatever, um, even stick figures, kids will like to tell stories if they can, because they got they got these ideas in their head about, and like I said, it's not even anything profound, it's just a story of two or three characters engaging in some silly little thing. That's all important um, to facilitate, so... I'm glad you guys are all looking at that as part of your, you know, curriculum and outreach to students. Um, okay. If anybody has any questions, I can take a few questions before I do my next little uh, thing here. I think I've got my timer here. I got a few more minutes. 
Yes, and I actually wanted to also just, you know, do a little introduction here to Dr. Uh, Cunningham, our, you know, director. I'm so happy to have you here also, uh, always supporting, you know, what we do as TOSAs and as teachers, really. Um, we're always looking for something new. You know, we know our students, sometimes, you know, it, we need to get motivated to motivate them. And when we hear about something new or something that, you know, we knew existed there and we can use in our classroom. I know I still get excited about trying something new. I was just sharing how to do a comic book using a program that we have called Book Creator to uh, my uh, ELD class. Those seventh graders, this little girl just lit up with the idea that she can create her own book and publish her own book. And I just love it. I was just feeding off her energy. I also wanted to introduce our ethnic studies coordinator, Ron, uh, who's here with us. Uh, and I'm hoping that he's also interested in, in maybe working together with you and then, you know, bringing uh, more of these kind of workshops for next year as we wrap up this year. Uh, but yes, let's see if anybody here has a question. And I'm going to actually go back to our hair deck as you all think about a possible question you might have. And I'm going to move the slides over. And One last thing really, really quick while they're thinking of a question. I'm, I'm also the co-founder of the Latino Comics Expo. It's the country's first comic convention dedicated to just spotlighting Latino creators. Uh, we started it back in 2011, uh, me and my friend Ricardo Padilla. By the way, I just learned this morning, his daughter called me. He passed away on last oh. night, which is, yeah, very oh. terrible news. Um, but um, but I bring up the expo just to let you guys know that, yeah, I created this platform where we bring in artists, creators to display their work. We usually mm -hmm. hold it at MOLA in Long Beach, the oh, Museum nice. of American yes. Art. So yes. um, we were, pla we're planning on doing it in November. We'll see right now, though, uh, how the family feels about that. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm always about giving the the creators a platform and also giving the students a voice to make a do their comics. All right. Well, let me see if anybody here has a question. So you, are you invited to ask questions or maybe even think about, can you see yourself having students do comic books or graphic books in your content, in your grade level? Think about maybe something that you're working on right now, right? Uh, a unit, how can they use some a platform like this or maybe even in the future? So a couple of ways to share, you can go to our Pear Deck and put it on this slide. You can add your response on chat or even better, how about you unmute, even better, unmute, and you can even turn on a camera and you know ask Javier a question. So I'm gonna pause right there. Let's see if anybody has a question. I just wanna say thank you, Javier, for being here with us. Um, it's really exciting to see um, writing being done in a creative way, unique styles, and giving students the opportunity to invent and innovate and create. Um, and we know from the research that the biggest thing that um, companies are looking for, the number one thing is creativity. Um, mm. And thank you to Araceli for uh, bringing, we know, um, I've seen some of the zines she's shared over the past, mm -hmm. I think, year now or so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so to have you here bringing, you know, expertise to different ways that we can help students with voice choice and agency to create. And like you talked about the connections. And then also with Ron here too, this is a lot of bringing in ethnic studies too, to writing and literacy across content. So thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, you're very welcome. Okay, so if anybody else has a question, comment. I have a question, Javier. Um, wonderful to see you. Thanks, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Araceli, for organizing this event. Uh, my friend Johnny Parker uh, speaks very highly of you. Johnny Parker, the second comic book creator, says, I know, says many, many wonderful things about you, Javier. So I, you. I was just kind of interested in, you know, uh, Araceli mentioned the book creator and kind of using different digital tools to create uh com comic books i i'm kind of like an old school like i like paper to pen kind of thing so like how, how have you balanced in in the in your work with young folks how have you balanced using like the digital tools in the ways of creating kind of like image images with with stories uh you know using these different platforms with actual pa paper to pen like you know laying things out with with pencil and coloring them in like where's the balance for you or which which one have you seen kids gravitate to towards one more than the other and is there something that happens based on your experiences in the minds of young folks that connects them and more than one versus the other just kind of wondering what your 
what your thoughts were on the strengths of, of each approach. Yeah, thanks, Ron. That's a good question because it hasn't that hasn't actually really come up much in my classes. Meaning, so when I teach a class, it's like we got paper and pencil. I mean, it's very cheap. Comics are very cheap. What's the nice thing about that? But I, like this semester, I had a student. She's like, "Well, I'm already doing my comics digitally on my computer on my iPad. So can I do the class, you know, on the computer?" I go, "Yeah, you can do it through the iPad." I mean, I don't know what the difference is. To me, it's just they're still drawing. Um, just some of them are adapting digitally, right? So they're not bothering with paper and pencil, and it's cleaner. Um, but story-wise, idea-wise, I don't think there's any difference. I mean, it's because it's just a tool, right? The 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 iPad. The student still has to, in their mind, they still have to think of us characters. They still have to think of a scenario, a story. So that takes place in the brain. Um, it's just the outlet it happens to be paper, pencil, or a digital tablet. Um, so, and my teaching doesn't really have to change much because I still have to have the students create the characters first, whether you draw it on paper or on a tablet, write a summary of each character, and then write me the plot for your little short story. Um, so it's a good question, Ron, because like I said, it's not something that has caused me any um, any need to adjust my teaching, really. Um, just in my observation, like, okay, they're drawing digitally or they're drawing on paper. But the thing is to get them to think of their story and create however, whatever comfort level, comfort level, level they have that's digital or paper. Mm -hmm. Very good, very good. All right. Anybody else? Uh, any other questions? You mind if I jump in? I have a question. Go for it. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm guess like I'm curious about like your um design process in terms of like these comics. Is it like as you write ideas come, or is it do you already have the idea in your head, and then you're just like, and then you're just like putting the work in of drawing it out. Yeah, yeah, for me, it, I'm I'm primarily a visual thinker, so I think of the character in my head. Like one day, you know, a year ago, a couple of years ago, I was asleep, and I must have been thinking or dreaming or whatever subconsciously of a character. I went to sleep thinking about this new character I wanted to make up, and I went to sleep, and then like at three in the morning, I just woke up, like okay, I know what he looks like, so I went over to my desk, turned the light on, and then I drew him out because it's in my head already what he looked like. I drew him out for about an hour, and I went back to sleep because it was like four in the morning. Um, so even my story, even like a storyline I think of in my head, like, I, you know, maybe it's bad, but I don't write notes. I don't have story notes. I just think of a concept for weeks or months in my head, and then I draw it out on the on the white paper. Okay, character wakes up in the house, and next panel they're making coffee, and then third panel, a meteor hits the house, whatever it is. Fourth panel, they get super, you know what I mean? Um, so that's how I work, but that's not the only way to work. I mean, some people actually write notes. Hey, here's my idea for Meteor Girl. One day she was, you know, she was hit by a meteor, blah, 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 blah. They need to write it out, which is fine. And then they'll design the characters visually, what she looks like and all that. So there, there is no one way to do comics. And then as a teacher, it's that your students don't, there is no one way to do anything really for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, and think about what I love about comics when I'm talking to kids is there's no right or wrong answer. See, when you're doing math, you have to follow the rules. One plus one always equals two. And, you know, chemistry, this chemical and that chemical make this chemical. Um, with art, it's different, you know, uh, especially drawing comics. There's no rule of how many panels per page, how big the panels have to be, what shape they have to be. All you got to do is tell your story. And it's got to be readable to the reader. Or it should be, unless you're like David Lynch, you don't care, and that's fine too. You know, if you want to make it very esoteric, um, don't be surprised if you lose the audience. David Lynch, I don't think, is surprised about that. Um, but you're telling a story that someone's going to read, so that's one thing I try have have the students be aware of. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Sure, thank you. Very good. Anyone else? And looks like I lost camera here, but that's okay. Uh, anybody else? Any? Final questions, and I'm going to go ahead and share the screen. And again, if anybody has a question, just so that you can see, I had two responses here. 
Um, so this person just basically uh, thinking of maybe using a comic as a way to introduce us, you know, for students to introduce themselves at the beginning of the year. But I like this question also here it says, have you ever helped any students get work, uh, get their work published? Oh, that's another great question. Um, no, I'm trying to think. I did teach a class for this organization one year where they had good funding, where I showed the students how to make comics. They did their own story based on a mental health topic. And then the organization, uh, actually they had this, they had the County of LA Health Department pay for the printing because it was like a, it was an outreach to the Latino community about mental health. So luckily we had the funding. So then the kids' comics were printed in this nice slick uh, comic book magazine. Um, but no, normally because the kids are younger, the high school or even grade school, you know, once the semester's over, that's it, I don't see them. Um, sometimes I get years later, I'll get contacted years later with the kids in college level. Hey, Mr. Hernandez, you can remember me, but I used to do this. Um, but no, no one's actually reached out to me for help with printing or finding a publisher. I mean, they'll just chime in and say hi and you know how much they appreciate this, the, the, the class. But yeah, I haven't had an opportunity or circumstance where I've actually helped someone get published. That's but it's a very good question. I'm sure it'll probably happen one day. Yeah, that would be great. Well, actually, I think that's a great segue into um, this idea that, you know, and Javier was the one who kind of uh, told me about it, was that maybe we can do something here at our district for next year. And, you know, um, you know, we have to work on a lot of logistics. But one of the things that here at the district that some of our TOSAs who are in the room today have been doing is Zooming with classes where we can invite a guest speaker and we could get hundreds of kids at the same time listening into a presentation just like this, where you could share your story. Maybe they can ask questions um, and just get that spark going and all the possibilities, especially since you're, you know, here a native, right, from East LA, right down the street over here in Whittier. Um, how exciting, you know, would that be? The other idea, which, you know, I'm a big dreamer. I love, you know, these big possibilities. And that is, uh, Javier mentioned, you know, what if we hosted like a Comic-Con at, you know, one of our schools? Uh, maybe start kind of small. Maybe each school starts their own little, little lunchtime Comic-Con. Kids create zines or these uh, book creator programs. And they could share, right? I love that idea of having a book fair from students, their, their own work, right? Uh, and able to display it now because of, you know, all of our tools that we have, uh, kids can display their work. And so that would be exciting to have, maybe even bring in some local artists to share what they're doing. So I wanted to just plant that seed in everyone's mind. Like uh, maybe if your students start creating these and you have those kiddos who are constantly doodling, that sometimes we as teachers say, put that away, <laughs> right? And instead tell them, guess what kid, don't put it away, do mm -hmm. more, right? And share it with the world. And so maybe, you know, if anybody here is interested and, and you know, wants to be part of that, Maybe we can organize a little Comic-Con, Anime Expo, <laughs> right? Zine Festival uh, sometime next year, too. How does that sound to you, Javier? Have you done those kind of things? Yeah, yeah. I've done those uh, presentations at schools where I would show up. and then, uh, But I've done library shows where you get a couple of artists together and, yeah, let the public interact and, like you said, show off their own work. That's a great place yes. to do that. And just to, I, and, you know, I always like to share this story. A couple of years back, I had this young kid who had a little video camera all the time. And as an English teacher, I always had kids make little mini films. And, you know, he was already very creative. Well, he ended up going off to college and he is one of the main actors in the Umbrella Academy, uh, David Castaneda. So wow. we talk about superheroes and I kept telling him, oh, you need to do a superhero movie. We need more Latino superheroes. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, we never know who's sitting in our classroom. We never know how we can tap into their, their creativity and, and maybe they make some you know, great things out of it. Uh, so uh, unless there's any other questions, are there any other questions out there? Uh, and if not, I'm gonna go ahead and move on to the second part of this workshop, which is how do we actually make comic books? So Javier, thank you for joining us. If everybody can give them yay, a little <laughs> a little applause there. And Thanks, give me everybody. one second. Give me one second. Let me take a quick, say cheese, everyone, if you're able to give me a second, turn on the camera, just so we can say thank you to our guests here. And uh, if you could turn on your cameras, yay. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Thank you, thank you. Yay. Uh, and I know my own kiddos would love to be able to do, you know, comic books in the classroom uh, and share their work. All right, let's do a quick little, quick little cheese. <laughs> here we go. Anybody else want? I'll do a little, yay. 
<laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs> really quick, uh, I'm going to leave you guys to your to your studies there, but uh, I'll be in, in Anaheim at the uh, Anaheim Public Library on uh, April 27th. They have something called Anacon. So it's going to be a little Comic-Con inside their library. Uh, that's Anaheim, Convent Anaheim Public Library, uh, April 27th. I think it starts at 11 a.m. But um, if you have any questions, you can ask Ada Sunny for my email. Be happy to talk to anybody about anything. So uh, thanks, everybody. And you guys are doing great work. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Javier. Thank you. <laughs> all right. All right. Yay. All right, everyone. So all I, I'm going to go ahead and jump back in. And if you have any questions, you can always, you know, put those in the chat. But let's talk about, um, so how can we use this, what we just talked about, uh, in our classrooms, making lessons, getting kids to start writing, maybe making their own. So um, give me a thumbs up if you have heard or used Book Creator. Is anyone familiar with Book Creator so far? Let's see if anybody knows. Now give me a quick thumbs up on uh, on Zoom here. It looks like not. Uh, so it, it's a program that we currently have that's free for teachers. We haven't, I believe, and Helene can correct me this. I don't know if you know about this. We haven't purchased it yet. Or we're looking at it. Um, it, it. There is, you know, free one also that teachers can use at a limited, you know, uh, use. But I wanted to show you just some of the things that you can do with Book Creator. Uh, so let me just kind of share some of the lessons. There's actually a little digital book called 50 Ideas that you can use with Book Creator. And I'm just going to read some of these art out. For example, instead of having students write a lab report, which is important also, but what if they wrote up a science experiment on a digital book format where they have to write the steps of their experiment? What if they had to come up with their own math problem using images as maybe math riddles? Here's another one. What if they had to give instructions on how to play a sport or use some kind of tool in PE classes? How about creating a comic book like we just said? Here's some more ideas. What if they took pictures and then they had to explain their artwork or their uh, digital pictures, right, that they're creating? Um, they can make poetry books and add images to the poems that they're writing. They can use Book Creator to collaborate with one another. What if our older students created books or read books to our younger kids or vice versa. Here's an idea, I love this idea, where the kids created a little monster, a little creature, and the older kids actually made the book for them and read it out loud. So a collaborative type of work in our between our schools. Or how about going global? We talk about MPDL, uh, right? And breaking down maybe the four walls of our classroom, right? How about collaborating with students from other parts of our city, our state, right, national, and, and kind of coming up with different topics uh, and writing a book. There's actually ways to create an anthology of stories within your classroom. So let me show you here. I'm going to just talk you through the, the different aspects here, but I'm actually going to jump on to Book Creator. So you can find Book Creator on ClassLink right now, and so can your students. So you're going to click on that icon, and I'm going to walk you through First, the Discover templates, then where you can find some support, where you can actually become certified and get your free account, right? So that's kind of cool. It's a two-hour little um, module, if you will. And then how you can start creating your own libraries. Please stop me along the way if you have any questions, right? Um, and I will answer them. All right, so I'm going to go over to, so if I go to class link, there it is, Book Creator, all right? And so here is my book creator account. So right now, all teachers, HLP USD, have an account, have a premium account. So this is where I'm at. I'm going to click on these little three lines here. And this is kind of like that home page. All right. Now, as you can see here, this is the library I've kind of been building. I'm going to start here with Discover. So if I go to Discover, I want to show you all the templates that already exist. So here I can scroll down. I could go based on different subjects. I could go by grades and I could show students some samples. And I'm just going to go here to literacy and just show you again some of the things that you can do that students can create or you can do for them to read, right? You can also have them just read. I just love this one. Here's a middle school one. And I really like this dinosaur one. 
So this is what the product would look like. So once the students have created, and again, this is all, this is created by a student, okay? So they get to choose the pictures, the layout, the cover. I love the fact that it turns the page this way, really cool. Take a look, notice that it has a read to me feature. So the program will, again, they can hear their book being read to them. So the student created all of these, right? Just went on some Google searches. They can embed video, right? They can embed, in, embed information. So, you know, I know sometimes we have students do Google slide presentations. What about if they did something like this to give uh, their information? Um, I love this where they actually have a little how to draw a dinosaur, right? How they can use different labelings. So, you know, again, think about those kids that can go down a rabbit hole of a certain topics, whether it's skateboarding or, you know, a football team that they love. They can create a book about that. Think about that kid that doesn't want to participate sometimes, seems a bit, you know, unengaged. This could be a way to get them there. Uh, here's another one. I'm going to do literacy and I'm going to go to our high schoolers. How can we get high schoolers? I really love uh, one here. And that was, uh, let's see, uh, AP Euro. So notice how many you know times this book has been read. So the kids get, you know, little uh, accolades there. They can see how much they get viewership. So this student here created a yearbook about the history that they're learning. So this is a, and I'm just going to flip through some of these pages. And I thought, talk about creativity, right? Using their knowledge, what a great way to assess their learning in a different way. Um, and I don't know, you can just kind of keep going through it. I think this one, I got a kick out of this one. Let me, homecoming game, musical. And I know it's a little dark, but prom, a time so fun you will lose your head. OMG, right? Again, those for the history buffs out there, right? And so forth. So again, you know, getting our students uh, to think differently, get them back engaged into some of this work. All right, so that's the discover. Any questions so far? <laughs> All right, I will keep going. The next template I'm gonna show you here, the next little area is this one. This is the learn. Take a look, if you have any questions, you can always go to this page and it'll show you how to get started. Some of them have little videos. Uh, some of them as short as 45 seconds just to go over how to uh, manage this program. And I'm gonna go to the last one, certification. If you listen to, notice how they're little short mini, right? Little videos totaling up to two hours, you actually can become a uh, author, right? A certified um, right uh, instructor for this program, which is pretty cool because you could put that on your resume, <laughs> right? And so you can do that. All right, I'm gonna go here. This is my library notice how, and again, I invite you to play along as you know, Sarah, and if uh, you, I think on my pair deck here, the link is there if you're interested in, in going to that link. I think I have it here, actually. Let me go back. So you can just go to bookcreator.com and get into or go to class link. And you can kind of take a look there as I'm talking. Here's my book collection. So if I go here, I'm just going to show you a few. Again, for some of your older kiddos, maybe you want them to create a newspaper, right? So again, I created this title. I put the HLP stand, right? Educators learn about book creator. Again, and I can record my voice. So think about how powerful this would be for your, especially your English learners, your ELD students who want to practice that language, right? You can have them read things to us. So students, and notice how beautiful this looks, very professional looking. So that might be a project. They can do a yearbook. I love the, just the beautiful images that students can choose from. So they can tell a story just by, images that are already part of this program. So I, this is the, the book I showed that student uh, the other day and her eyes just lit up with the idea of, of coming up with their own story. And we also talk about students making their own comic books. So here's a comic book I made just yesterday. And all I have to do is, so here's my page, I'll show you what you have. Again, just quick adding images. I go here, I can add images or I can get images from the internet or from my own, right? I put my own little dialogue bubbles. 
right? If I go here, right? I love, of course, the Joker. And I even put myself there. So there you go. They can make their own, right? Pictures. They can even put their own drawings. So if they had their own drawings, they could take a picture of it and they can do that. And then again, here's, there's actually a way to embed GIFs or GIFs if you call them, right? So if I go here and if I go just plus, again, I can go to images. I already have, I can search them up here or I can go to my own, right? I can add a new panel. So if I wanted to add, and I'm just giving a quick little preview, I can add panels here, decide how I want to make my comic book. I could then add text, thought bubbles, right? Images and so forth. If I wanted to add GIFs, I would just add an app and it tells me which apps I can add. So I can connect this to Bitmojis, take a look at everything I can add to Canva, right? So, you know, as we know, technology is constantly changing and they're adding new things all the time. If you have a class, so here's, for example, a class that I was working with. Here's a book, a couple of books that some of the students I was working with, they created their own book. These are students who had been struggling uh, with literacy. So I had them create their own book. They loved it. Notice how it says show invite code. So here I can put this code, let's say on Canvas or whatever you're using, and the students would now be part of this library. They would then add their book here. So you can now have a collection of your class books. All right, so that's a little bit on how to use Book Creator. There's lots of little video tutorials. Also, our tech toses have been doing an awesome job of going to different schools and showing students how to do Book Creator. Uh, you're also welcome to invite me to your classroom and I can give a little workshop to your students. I love being a guest teacher um, and working with your kiddos. You can sit in the back and kind of just uh, listen in and see how, I, how you know, students interact with the program. So that's another way. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pause there. Let's see if there's any questions about Book Creator. I'm going to go back to Pear Deck. And I'm actually going to have you kind of interact with it a little bit. And let me go here. And let me see if I can have you answer two quick questions, uh, two ideas. How might you use Book Creator in your class for your content? I'm gonna have you go ahead and type in those responses. And if you're not on Pear Deck, you can go to, you can type it in on chat. And I'm gonna have, I'm gonna pause for a second and let you think about that. How might you use Book Creator in your program? Uh, the question is, yes, you should have a teacher accounts through uh, HLP USD. It's using your, you know, logging in through your email. Or if you go through class link, you should be able to get on there. Okay, let more of you answer, how might you use Book Creator in your class? In your classes, maybe two different ways. Think about some of those lessons I showed you there. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, I believe that through their own class link, they should be able to go on to Book Creator. The other way is you can invite them. And this is for Joseph, you're answering. Uh, Joseph, you can invite them through the code. So if you want to see have access to all of their books, whatever they're creating, you can invite them to your library. Or if you want them to just kind of play with it and just kind of explore the site, they can go on to class link, go on, click on, um, book creator. That's the way I had those two students. So these are two students I'm working with uh, as case studies. And I just had them log on. They were able to find book creator and I gave them the code and they were able to share it. So I do believe they have access to that. Uh, yes. How might you use this as a right multi-genre project? Yes. 
And like I said, there is a way that you can create an anthology. So let's say, you know, all of your students are writing about, um, you know, farewell messages to incoming sixth graders, right? Like what would you, how to survive middle school, how to survive high school, right? You can actually combine all of their books. So there's a way to combine and make one book. All right, I'm going to go ahead and go back to Pear Deck and let's see what we're saying here. All right, so how might you use Book Creator? All right, and be ready for me to maybe call on you. It says, I'm already getting ideas for having the kids write narratives. Mm -hmm. All right, yes. So, you know, think about the units that you're doing right now. I know this is through Steady Sync, right? They're fascinated with Egyptian life, right? And I, I think about it, I mean, we just had this awesome event, right? The solar eclipse and how did different cultures uh, view an eclipse, right? Or or how they view the afterlife and, and so forth. Definitely for narrative writing, comic book of a historical figure's life event. Yes. Having students create an end of the year uh, book where they teach the class about something that interests them. Very good. Mm -hmm. Yep. Unpacking a complex text using short, short speech bubbles and gif gifs. Yes. Right. Um, they, they call them, I think I saw it named uh, Book Snaps. Uh, and that is one of the 50 lessons. We'll go back to that uh, page um, where you take a part of that story and you can analyze it using those thought bubbles. Students could retell a story in modern times. Yes. Read Across America book to read to primary classes. Mm -hmm. Creating step-by-step -step, uh, for how to solve math problems. Creating a class book of vocabulary words in another language. Yes. Students could write a short story about an SEL skill being discussed. Yes, right? Awesome. I love these. Explain the different types of waves, sound, and light. Creating a story of the solar system. Awesome. All right. I love these ideas. Keep writing them in. We'll sure. Share some more. Okay. So again, um, I'm going to go back here. Book creator, right? Uh, this idea of, of uh, having, right, um, different ways. If I go back to discover, this is where you can find so every day they come kind of have new ideas. This is where I found that 50 ways to teach, right, to use book creator. So you can see here. Um, they have some great um, templates, right? Uh, it, some of you talked about like how to introduce students to each other as a beginning of the year. There's templates already, books for that. Here it is, you know. Uh, and so great, great stuff that you can just explore. Uh, I had a teacher like, I want to use this tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, right. And kids, it's pretty intuitive. So kids pick up really quickly how to how to use this. I've taught these kind of workshops and fourth grade classes, fifth grade classes. And before I know it, the kids have already did it all before I even finished explaining all the steps. Okay. All right. We have a little bit of time. I'm going to go ahead and uh, talk about the second half of this. And that's going to be how to use zines. And then I'm going to have you make something. Okay. So before you leave, if you can make something either on book creator or on uh, zines. All right. So let me go here. Okay. Let's talk about what in the world is a zine. So one of the things I do talk a lot about is tech fatigue. I want you to think about this for a second. If you have older kids who have cell phones and they're using laptops all day in the classroom, because a lot of teachers are now using uh, different apps in the classroom, kids can possibly go all day long on a laptop, all day long on a screen, then on their cell phone, then go home and do more cell phone. Uh, maybe they're watching YouTube videos. Maybe they're on Instagram. Maybe they're video gaming. My goodness, talk about too much technology. So how do we get kids off a little bit, right, off the screen? Well, one way to do it is through this thing called zines, short for mini magazines. And so here are some examples, and this is just using a sheet of paper. And so there are different types of zines that you can make, and I'm just going to list some of them here. So they can do photography. Notice how they can do mixed media. So they can take pictures, they can do drawings, they can get pictures from magazines, right? So think of it kind of like collages. They can do political zines, social zines that they're really interested in, you know, animal rights and so forth. Fan zines, they're interested in certain music, right? Certain, like we said, sports or hobbies, personal zines, uh, health zines. So you can choose 
a topic for them or they can do their own. Again, here are some other ones, right? So again, just a sheet of paper. I'm going to show you how to do that. Okay, again, you can get your little ones to do zines. Here's more, more sophisticated ones, right? More artsy ones. And what I'm going to do here, uh, so this is my sister-in-law who actually does zine workshops at libraries. And again, it's become a very popular uh, hobby, right? And I'm just going to show you more. This is a zine workshop. So I want you to think about yesterday, <laughs> right? Um, all of a sudden, no internet, right? Uh, yeah, I know. My camera's not working. <laughs> so that's why I can't have my camera on. <laughs> I tried. Uh, but just here... Imagine yesterday, you know, no internet, can't use the apps, can't use Google Slides, whatever. What if you already had them doing zines on some couple of sheets of paper? They can create their little mini books about whatever you're teaching, right? I had my ELD students talk about, uh, tell me the story of the monkey's paw in your own words, right? So they can create their own books. Here is an example of a zine festival. So again, extremely popular, right? There's conventions all over LA and all over the state, actually. So there you go. People selling their own zines, maybe even exchanging. So think about having uh, your own class exchange of zines. Um, one of the things that students do is they make their little mini magazines, get the, somebody to photocopy a whole bunch, and now they have, they're a published work, right? Published author. They've been able to produce many. And then some people even sell them, okay? So let me go ahead and jump over here. And I'm going to show a little video since I can't show. Uh, I was going to do a demonstration. But let me go here. And I'm just going to walk you through how to put together a zine. So give me a second. Mm -hmm. And please let me know if... You don't hear, you don't hear the sound. Thank you. Give me one second, and we are. Puts it this way, a non-commercial, often homemade, or online publication, usually devoted to specialized and often unconventional subject matter. In short, a zine is something that you make yourself about whatever you want it to be about, even if it's super weird or unique to you as a person. People will often make zines about topics or communities that mean a lot to them, such as feminism and human rights. However, you can make a zine, for example, about something you're a fan of, referred to as a fanzine, or even a zine that's just about you and your life, called a personal zine, or perzine for short. Artists will also create zines to distribute their work, whether they're illustrators, photographers, writers, whatever you can fit into the pages of a zine goes. Someone who creates zines is called a zinester. The term zine came from the 1920s or 30s, when sci-fi geeks would create zines about themselves and share them with each other. Zine culture exploded in the 70s, when the punk scene emerged. People would create music zines to draw more attention to bands they liked. Most zines are made by cutting and pasting pages together, photocopying them, and then binding them into a booklet, typically with staples. However, there are a lot of zines that are made with unconventional materials, into unconventional shapes. And there are also digital zines. Basically, there are zero rules here. Your zine can look however you want it to look. You don't necessarily have to be an artist to create a zine. All you really need is paper, a pen, and something to say. Hope you enjoyed the video. Next week, I'll be uploading episode 2, How to Make Your Own Zine. Subscribe to be notified when it goes up. All my social media links are in the description. I make my own zines and I post about it sometimes. Thanks for watching. <laughs> All right. So that's a little bit on um, how, uh, you know, the history of zines. But let me show you this one also. Making. It's so much fun. All you need is one single piece of printer paper, eight and a half by 11 inches. With this, you can make an eight page zine, believe it or not. So, how you ask? It starts with folding. 
Fold the paper. Hot dog way. Open it back up. Oh, that hot dog was so good, but I'm really hungry for a hamburger now. Good thing I made a barbecue. Now, it gets a little trickier from here. You gotta fold in the sides to that center line you've just created with your hamburger fold. Open everything back up. And one more time with the hamburger fold. Now we're gonna take our friends, the scissors, and cut a little slit on the folded edge right to the middle. Open it back up. Saying hello to our friend the hot dog one more time. Stand it up on its end and squish it together and fold all the pages together. And you have the skeleton of your eight page zine. All right. So I won't show all of that. All right. So that's pretty much what a one page zine looks like. All right. A simple one page sheet of paper, right? They can make their own little book, decorate it, come up with their own stories. And there you go. You can even have your own little zine festival there. I'm going to go ahead and give you time to think about how you can use anything we just talked about today, zines, right? And here's a class that I taught at Cedar Lane and they were doing zines, right? Uh, all within one class period, I showed them the history, I showed them how, and then they got to it and they created their own little zines. So I'm gonna go ahead and as I get uh, your timesheets ready and also the raffle, I'd like you to take some time to answer this, these questions here. Okay, so this is on Pear Deck. So uh, answer the questions there, and I'm going to go back to actually my prayer deck. And answer those questions there. Oh, and by the way, on this Google slide, I'm going to go ahead and give you this template for a Who Am I poem. This is what I use with that class at Cedar Lane. They first wrote their poem, a Who Am I poem, coming up with something from nature, an animal, a place. After they made their poem, they turned it into this I am poem, as you see here, and then we turned it into a zine. So you can, you know, do that tomorrow if you don't have a lesson ready to go and you want to give something, maybe if you're going to be out for a sub, that would be a great little lesson to do. Okay, so let me go ahead and have you go back to Pear Deck. There's our Pear Deck. And a couple things I'd like you to do. Answer these questions. And if you get a chance, let's see if you can go on Book Creator and I'll see if anybody wants to share. I'm going to go ahead and get the raffle ready to go. And if you have any questions, let me know. Again, you know, as we end the, the year, we have six weeks left, try something new. And there's all kinds, you know, sometimes we get app happy, I think here, around here. Uh, I know I talk a lot about Sway. I talk a lot about Pear Deck, what I'm using right now. Um, now, of course, Book Creator uh, for our English learners. Yeah, I love using Pear Deck with Immersive Reader. So, uh, again, kids can benefit from so many of these tools and just get them re-engaged into wanting to learn and produce. So again, there's my contact information. Can I share right. something I was working on? Yes, yes, yes. Go for it, Ron. I mean, th this is new for me. So I was just working on kind of like half comic, half, half poster, you know, like if you can give an assignment to a student, in my case, thinking about ethnic studies, you can give people different historical figures. Uh, can you see what I'm sharing? Oh, let, hold on a second. Let's see. Give me one second. Uh, let me go. Oh, yeah. Okay. Let me see. Yeah. So just thinking about like, you know, let's say you had 25 historical figures. Mm -hmm. If you gave a student, you know, create one page or three pages on this person, and they can create something like this in 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes. And then if you could print those out, you could put them on the wall, you could put them on the poster board, you could put them in the hallway, a way to bring visibility to uh, different folks in history that haven't been taught about or that we're trying to highlight. Uh, so I'm new to the app. I'm new to this platform. And just from your like 
brief presentation, I was able to see it's really easy to use. So I can imagine students can pick up on this even quicker than us adults and really kind of take off with it and be able to put their their research into something that looks clean, looks neat, looks professional. Wow. Did and you just make that right now? I mean, I was just playing with it. Yeah, so <laughs> it was it was fun. Awesome. Yeah, so I was just trying to play with it and figure it out. Some of the image search, like the image, the Google image searches seemed a little limited, but then it allows you to upload from your computer. Yeah. So if the students are able to like find images from Google and kind of create those ahead of time and upload those from the computer, I think the amount of images are kind of endless, but there was like kind of a limited amount of images, but yeah. there was still a lot that you can find on the digital platform. I just wanted to thank you for showing us this. Uh, it's really cool. So I want to definitely learn how to use it more. Yes, thank you, thank you. And Elizabeth, thank you all of you, especially those of you who've been attending all these, you know, different uh, PDs that I've given. I hope to do many more and I'm definitely going to look into having some kind of a Comic-Con here, Anime-Con, something, uh, we'll work out the details. But thank you all. Have a great rest of uh, the year. And as 